please take a seat. Okay, advisors, presidents, Dharma brothers and sisters, good afternoon. Okay, uh, today I'd like to share some thoughts on the Diamond Sutra. Uh, this particular session was supposed to be a continuation of uh, yesterday's session, but unfortunately, some of you have not attended the first part. Okay, so today would be more like a recap of uh, yesterday's session, but with a little bit of uh, flexibility in that sense. Okay, who here has ever read the Diamond Sutra before? Okay. Raise your hands nice and high. Okay, so we have a few people, yeah? Who can understand the Diamond Sutra? Or who thinks they can understand the Diamond Sutra? Okay, it's a very, it's a very difficult text, yeah? So sometimes people say that the Heart Sutra is an introductory uh, text or sutra to Buddhism, but I see it very differently. Uh, because Heart Sutra and Diamond Sutra are part of the Pratnyaparamita corpus of texts and it is uh, considered one of the most difficult to understand uh, because mainly of its uh, structure as well, of, as well as its very deep context. Okay? Uh, so just a bit of a brief introduction. The Diamond Sutra was uh, copied or written down in 200 CE uh, by several Indian monks. Yeah? And later on it was translated into, six, uh, into, Ch into Chinese by six different translators. And Kumarajiva happens to be the foremost in the translation. Because the text is so difficult itself, right? And then to add difficulty by making the text complex, I think it will be very difficult to decipher. So uh, Kumarajiva has used a very simple uh, yet fluent way of translation. Okay. This text has uh, 32 vesicles and originally uh, it was just one chunk of text. So imagine one whole 5,000 word piece of text talking about things we do not understand. Yeah, it will be very difficult for us. Uh, but very luckily, we had uh, someone by the name of Liang Zhaoming, who is the son of Liang Wudi from the Liang Dynasty. And he had very nicely uh, categorized the entire sutra into 32 fascicles. And in doing so, he has allowed us at least to some degree come to grips with what this whole sutra is trying to talk about. Yeah? Originally, this text was uh, called the perfection of wisdom in 300 lines, okay? And, uh, but nowadays we know it more by the Diamond Sutra. Okay? In the Tang Dynasty alone, there have been 800 commentaries on this particular text. So this goes to show how important this text have become later in the development of Chinese Buddhism, yeah? And it was also considered uh, a type of uh, benchmark for prestigious institutions. It was like the entrance exam uh, for these particular schools. It was also the entrance exam for being a monastic. Okay? So imagine this, if you could not memorize this uh, Diamond Sutra, you could not get into the Harvard of uh, ancient day China. Okay? It would have been very difficult. And likewise, if you could not memorize the Diamond Sutra, you could not become a monk. Okay, so unfortunately, if I was born in that era, I probably would not be a monk, okay? I'm sure no one has found it easy, we could say, to memorize the Diamond Sutra. Uh, the Diamond Sutra also has several uh, milestones okay, in itself. It is considered the very first printed book in history, okay? The very first printed book. And we know this because uh, a particular example of this book was found uh, in the Donghuang Caves, 1907, uh, by Taoist monks. And this Taoist monk, because he was not Buddhist, he felt that I could capitalize on, on this finding. Yeah? So he sold this particular example uh, to the British uh, Library and made a pretty penny. Okay, so we know that uh, the very first book that was ever printed is the Diamond Sutra. And the reason why it was printed in the first place, uh, for those of you who have read the Diamond Sutra in the, uh, before, we know that it tells us that we need to distribute and recite and share this sutra with other people. 
And in doing so, uh, there was this layman by the name of Liang Jie, sorry, uh, by the name of, uh, well, see, I, I'm not abiding in names, okay. Um, so there was this uh, young person who wanted to uh, trans transfer the merits of this particular uh, sutra uh, to his parents. So this was done out of filial piety, okay. And this is the example behind me of the very first copy of the Diamond Sutra. And if we talk about the who, what, where, and why of the Diamond Sutra, okay, the audience for this particular gathering where the Diamond Sutra was expounded was actually uh, to lay people, okay, to shravakas, to people who hear the Dharma and attain awakening, bodhisattvas, as well as high-level bodhisattvas, so many different types of people. Yeah? But the two main characters are the Buddha and none other than Shibuti. Who knows who Shibuti is? Who knows who Shibuti is? Shibuti. Okay, does he ring a bell? He appears in many sutras, especially with the perfection of wisdom text. Yeah? He is actually uh, known for being the foremost in understanding emptiness. And he is also the one who takes the place of the Buddha to expound on uh, concepts like emptiness. So he, he is a very important person. And even his uh, birth and the naming of Shibuti has a story behind it. Who here, when your son or daughter was born, had made all your belongings disappear? I'm, I'm sure that none of you had this situation. Yeah? So when Shibuti was born, all the treasures within the household had disappeared. And of course, as parents, they'd be quite uh, uh, anxious, thinking that this is a bad omen, that something will, bad will happen with this son. Okay? So the parents actually called upon uh, a soothsayer, a type of, uh, you could say, fortune teller, to try to ascertain what this means. Yeah? So this fortune teller, uh, after a while, ha had figured out that this son would one day become someone special. The reason why all the treasures within the household had disappeared means that this son is foremost in understanding uh, the concept of emptiness. And as thus, uh, firstly, this uh, soothsayer had given the son the name born in emptiness. Okay? But later, he thought to himself, you know, the parents may have paid him a pretty penny to have his fortunes hold. So he did not want to make a scene of it. So he decided to give him the name Good Existence. Okay? Shu, which is the Sanskrit word meaning good, and Bhuti meaning existence. So this is how the name Shibuti had come. And at what time was this uh, sutra spoken? At what time? Okay? Was it yesterday? Was it 2,000 years ago? Is it 2,000 years in the future? It's irrelevant. Okay? So in, at the beginning of Buddhist sutras, we always see at one time. Okay, this signifies that the Buddha's teachings are timeless. They are true now, they were true before, and they will always be true wherever we are. Okay, so this is uh, significant of this. And this was uh, spoken at Jetta's Grove uh, at uh, the benefactor of uh, orphans and widows. And uh, this, uh, of course, this had a gathering of thousands, tens of thousands, tens of, thousands of people who have come, come to hear the Buddha expound on emptiness. And the origins of this sutra comes by Shibuti's question. Buddha, Buddha, how can we give rise to the mind of greater special aspiration? And how shall we let our mind stand? Also, how can we uh, subdue this mind of duality? Yeah? So let's read this verse together. World honored one, when good men and good women commit themselves to perfect enlightenment, how should they stand and how should they tame their mind? So the word stand has two meanings. Okay? In Chinese, it's zu, okay? as in live, zu. The first meaning is to abide somewhere, okay? to be firm, to be steady and unmoving, to be fixed. Whereas the other meaning is to be attached. Okay? So there are slight differences in the understanding of the word zu. But in English, it's easy. You can use the word stand or abide. But even, even the word abide, which several sutras use, or several translations of this sutra use, uses, uh, tends to be misleading. Because abiding 
kind of has the connotation of attachment. So in order to prevent this, uh, we use the word stand. Okay, so where shall we stand? In other words, when we give rise to the mind of a bodhisattva, giving rise to anuttara samyak sambuddhi, how shall we allow the mind to continue like that forever? How can we allow the mind not to change? Okay? And likewise, how to tame the mind? The mind which sees that I am different from you and they. The mind which causes a lot of dualism and discrimination between people and things. Okay? Let's stop for a moment. What are the dangers of having a mind which distinguishes between I and you? All we need to do is take the idea of Sudan. Yes, Sudan was, uh, is currently kind of like one country, but two leaders representing two different groups of people, they all have a different definition of what Sudan is. They all have different vested interests as to how the country should prosper. And as such, these two countries have slowly split. Okay, there has been a division. Uh, and lately, if we've read the news, what has the Pope done? The Pope has uh, asked these two leaders to come. Okay, and the Pope, out of full sincerity and humility, he had kissed the feet of both leaders, uh, wishing upon them that they can let go of their differences and live in peace. Because at the end of the day, Sudanese, most of them are Catholic. So how can Catholics kill Catholics and go to war with one another? Okay, so even the type of discrimination that is inherent in the ordinary mind, in the mundane mind, is pretty much the source of all conflict and suffering. And this is what the Diamond Sutra is all about, trying to get through this type of dualism. Okay, so before we get into the content and the, the kind of main notions of this particular sutra, most importantly, we need to understand the pedagogical style of this particular text, yeah? How the Buddha has used uh, linguistics and how the Buddha has used the mode of delivery to allow readers and disciples uh, to see through such dualism, yeah? So let us have a look at an example at how this uh, repetition of the Buddha's teachings work. So let's read this together. A bodhisattva should practice giving without abiding in anything. This is like the opening statement, the punchline. But later on, with part B, the Buddha elaborates on this. Let's read this together. This means that he should not give abiding in form, nor should he give abiding in sound, smell, taste, touch, or dharmas. Shibuti. A bodhisattva should not give abiding in any notion whatsoever. And why is this? If a bodhisattva gives without abiding in any notion whatsoever, then his merit will be immeasurable. So we see an opening statement. Then we see an elaboration on the first point. And on the third point, it's like a reaffirmation of the first opening statement. And the Buddha finishes off with a conclusion or a type of synthesis. So we can see that the Buddha uses a, a very effective means to allow us to fully understand uh, the topic at hand, given the complexity of the issue. Okay? But in having said this, uh, this text is 5,000 words long, and most of the 5,000 words are just repetition. Okay? Coming from a time where everything was oral transmission, everything was memorized, passed on from teacher to disciple. If we could not memorize the text, then of course we cannot practice it. And it was important, uh, obviously, for us to be able to at least understand this text through repetition. Okay, so this works on pedagogy. And the second part I'd like to bring our attention to is the negation. Okay, the concept of trying to uh, put an error in the statement out and then trying to uh, see through this particular error in the statement with another viewpoint. Uh, usually a negation of that fact. And then finally to come back, arrive at a conventional understanding of this erroneous uh, concept, okay? So in actual fact, it's, it's like this. What is this, guys? What is this? A clicker, right? Is it really a clicker? Is it really a clicker? What happens one day if I accidentally drop this on the highway 
and the next car comes over and runs over it, is it still a clicker? No. It will become dust. Okay, just broken bits and pieces of a previously called clicker. Okay, so from here we can see that phenomena does not uh, exist uh, permanently. It does not have a kind of autonomous self. Okay? And because of this, we can see that all things are empty of such autonomous nature. Okay? But having said this, we cannot dwell always on the fact that everything is empty. Otherwise, we will become um, a, a very nihilistic kind of person. We will see everything as empty. We will see our husbands and wives and daughters and sons as empty and we will lose the love for them. Okay, so unfortunately we cannot be too attached uh, to the idea of emptiness itself as well. And the whole purpose of this negation uh, is for, for the fact that every time we have a type of attachment to ideas, we pick up this sutra and recite it. So this sutra becomes not just a text we read once, put it down and forget uh, in the future. It's something which we need to revisit over and over again as we live our lives and grow our wisdom. Okay, so every time we pick up this book, it means something different to us. Okay, so it, it is in itself a type of practice just by reading. Okay, let us have a look at an example of such uh, negation. Shibuti, let's read this together. Don't be attached to not speaking. Okay? Shibuti, that which is said to be all phenomena is not all phenomena, and that is why it is called all phenomena. Shibuti, when a person speaks the Dharma, no Dharma can be spoken, and thus it is called speaking the Dharma. Okay, let us ha have a look at fascicle 17 to start off with. Okay, all phenomena is not all phenomena. That, why, that is why it is called phenomena. Okay, it's kind of like make up your mind. Is it is, not, maybe, you know, just make up your mind, okay? But this is not the point here. This is exactly the whole idea of getting rid of notion or attachment to a substantial I, substantial I, okay? The second part is a little bit more difficult to understand because when we talk about phenomena, it's easy to say this is impermanent, this does not exist forever. But when you see the Dharma with a capital D, most people see the Dharma as some sort of sublime uh, truth which is transcendental of all worldly and mundane phenomena. Yeah? This is pretty much the understanding of everyone. Okay? But the Dharma in this particular context means that we use words, conventional means of language to try to express something which is inexpressible. So, we have a situation where just say that the Dharma is like the moon. Okay? We can only be pointing to the moon through language. And this particular uh, phrase is reminding us that we cannot be too attached to the words, to the words the Buddha has very kindly and compassionately uh, come to use to express the truth. Okay? So it is a way to remind us that uh, although the truth is intangible, inexpressible, there are words to express it. But at the end of the day, we need to be able to uh, experience it, okay? come to our own realization and insight into the truth and not be too caught up with the words. And I think this is the whole concept of this type of negation. Yeah. Venerable Master Sing Yun, when he was young, he actually went through some vigorous training. Okay? to the point where there was a lot of hitting and shouting involved. And I'm sure most of our uncles and aunties here uh, who have gone through the traditional schooling system would have uh, appreciated this a lot, okay? Well, hopefully. So Venerable Master, when he was young, every time uh, he went through his schooling, yeah, the, the teachers would actually scold him for looking around and following the sounds outside the classroom because at a Buddhist college, the whole idea is to focus the mind and discipline it so much uh, that you no longer are affected by the outside world. Okay, so naturally he was hit a lot. Okay, every time he listened to the sounds outside, he'd be hit and reminded that, hey, student, what sound is yours? What sound belongs to you? Even your body does not belong to you. How can the sounds belong to you? Okay, and at other times, 
Okay, the venerable master was a quick learner, so every time he was hit, he'd be a good student and, and quickly withdraw his gaze and focus on the teacher. But other times, the teacher would hit him and say, Student, what sound is not yours? The whole universe is yours. How can you not even, how can you exclude your sounds? Okay, and at other times, he'd look around, looking at all the different sites within the classroom, and yes, again, he was hit. The teacher would say, Venerable, why are you looking around? What site is yours? So from that day on, after he was hit for that, he remained a very diligent student, not looking at anything, just like a robot. So the Venerable Master had effectively become a robot. So upon leaving Buddhist college, he was hit once again. Open your eyes. What site is not yours? The whole universe is yours. How can you deny the fact that what you see in front of yours is not yours? Okay? So we can see this back and forth. Okay? The whole idea is to break through the understanding that something exists and something is yours, but at the same time, not be attached to the idea that that thing is not yours. Okay? So the Diamond Sutra is quite interesting. And the next point brings us to the next point, which is to say that even negation itself should not be held onto. So let, let's read the next part. Shibuti, those sentient beings are not sentient beings. And they are not not sentient beings. And why is this? Shibuti, the Tathagata has said that all sentient beings are not sentient beings. And that this is what is called sentient beings. So, having said this, we have now kind of like tried to understand the structure of the Diamond Sutra. This happens from physical 1 all the way until 32. So next time you get caught in the maze of negation, at least you can know that from here there are several points. First of all, the Buddha is trying to let us see beyond uh, this conventional existence of objects, but at the same time, he does not want us to be too uh, caught up with the fact that we see the emptiness of things. And it brings back the context by saying that you cannot be attached to negation in the first place. Yeah? So let us continue with the structure of the sutra. Venerable Yudeng one month ago would have covered uh, fascicles 1 to 16. And this, uh, the first part would be more aligned with those who have just started on the path people who have just uh, become a bodhisattva and would like to learn how to live nicely and happily. But chapter 17 is like the recruitment agency wanting this bodhisattva to not only work for him or herself, uh, but to bring uh, his mind to all sentient beings, bring his purpose uh, on his spiritual practice uh, to all sentient beings. Okay. And uh, later on, from chapter or fascicle 18 to 29, it's all about how to perfect uh, the path of the Bodhisattva so one day you can arrive at Buddhahood. But the Buddha knows that all sentient beings are not Bodhisattvas yet. Although today I am pretending that all of you here are well-attained Bodhisattvas and getting right into the content, unfortunately it, not may, it may not always be the sense and the case. So obviously the Buddha is compassionate. And from fascicle 30 to 32, he draws the attention back to the mundane. Okay? Um, and uh, turning our attention to the title of this particular sutra, it's uh, Vajra Chadika Pratnya Paramita Sutra. Okay? So Vajra meaning diamond. Okay? Vajra meaning diamond. Some people say thunderbolt. Okay, but diamond is probably a better representation of what the diamond is according to the analogy of the sutra. Okay? So tell me, what are the different characteristics of diamond? Apart from the fact that many of our Dharma brothers here who are married would have spent a pretty penny on diamonds. Okay? Apart from the fact that it's expensive, what other characteristics are there of diamonds? Sorry? Yes. Clear? It's clear, okay. See through. What else? Hard, okay. Immovable, tough. And it's just like what? Something which can cut, okay. Uh, to date, I don't think there is anything which can cut a diamond, 
okay, conventionally, but a diamond can cut everything else. Okay, so from here we see that it represents the pratnya wisdom, which can cut through all the illusion, and nothing can move it, nothing can destroy it, and nothing can, uh, you could say, uh, cause it to fail in some sense. So we can see that uh, Vrajra is just like diamond. Uh, Chadika means to cut through, okay, to cut through. So it means the diamond which cuts through, okay, the diamond which cuts through. So once we can cut through all delusions and all erroneous ways of seeing the world, then naturally we can see clearly. So, so the whole idea of being a Buddhist is none other than to see clearly, to see past all the delusions uh, which we have. Okay? We will be speaking a little bit of the delusions further on. Okay? And when we can see clearly, only then can we have success. Okay? So now, let us first define what success is. Okay? What is the definition of success to you personally? Okay, what is success? Success is not speaking. Success is silence. What is success? What is success? Sorry? Happy. A happy life. Okay, who else has a different definition of happiness? Happy life? Happy family? happy career, successful career, okay? So in Buddhist terms, success does not leave worldly success, but it also entails transcendental success, meaning that in our practice of Buddhism, not only do we do well in this lifetime, we also do well spiritually in our uh, eternal life, in our spiritual life, yeah? So from here we see that success is both worldly and transcendental, there is no difference in the sense of success, okay? Now, what is the secret to success? What is the secret to success? Let's say there's a universal success for, universal secret to success for everything. What would that universal secret be? It must be applicable and generalizable to all fields of life whether it's career, schooling, children, family, and, and just your general life. Okay, what is this secret? What is this secret? What is your secret for life? What is your secret for life? The secret of silence. Okay. I feel that uh, uh, today's class is all about silence just like the Chan Masters, okay, the secret of silence, yeah? So in Buddhism, we say that uh, the secret to success is Pratnya wisdom, okay? And this Pratnya wisdom uh, is not bound by the definition of worldly and transcendental. So whether you want to succeed in your Buddhist practice or whether you want to succeed in your career, it's exactly the same secret. The formula is to see clearly, okay? Why do I say this? If you want to succeed in your business, you need to see clearly, you need to see your market. You need to be very clear exactly with what the people in your market need. And then we need to be very clear to define our business within the com competition. We need to see where we can really shine our true colors. But before we do so, we need to see clearly. And after seeing clearly, we need to understand all the elements which make this business successful. The right people, the right customers, okay? the right friends in the various departments and so forth. So it's all about how to create these conditions for success. But before that, the secret is seeing clearly. Okay? Pratnya wisdom. So uh, basically, to, to actually cut through delusion is part of the mission of the Diamond Sutra. To see clearly is the result of doing so, okay? And after doing so, then we can apply what we do know and what we see in life, okay? What does everyone see on this slide? What does everyone see on this slide? Apart from silence. 
a black dot. Who agrees they see a black dot? One person out of many. Okay, for most people, the very first thing they see is what is apparent. Okay, and in life, I think this is the greatest flaw of human, uh, you could say, consciousness. And because we only see what is apparent, many times we miss out on the important factors of life. So sometimes when we look at our children, they may seem naughty and playful and disrespectful, but do we see the type of respect and the type of uh, compassion of our children? Maybe not, because we only see things at face value. When our parents scold us, we only see the fact that mother is just being like an old woman and nagging here and there, but we, don't, we do not see the fact that the mother is trying to do the best for us, trying to change our way of thinking so that we can bring goodness on, our, on ourselves and our families. Yeah? So to see past the points where we only see is the whole idea of letting go. Okay? Of letting go, of non-abiding. And when we can let go, then the whole universe becomes ours. Okay? Venerable Master uses the, the idea of Sing Bao Tai Xu, okay, which means that our mind has the potentiality to encompass the entire universe. But before so, the prerequisite means that we need to let go. Let go of the very limited understanding we have of the universe. Let go of all the attachments, delusions we have so far, so that we can see the bigger picture. Yeah? So, the Buddha nature we always talk about, okay, the Buddha nature we always talk about can seem a bit distant, okay, something which is very abstract. But Venerable Master uses the idea of the universe, okay, of this, uh, the, the whole whiteness around the black dot to represent this Buddha nature, okay. The mind which is not attached is the mind of Pratnya, and the mind of Pratnya is the, is the mind of the Buddha nature. Okay, so from here we can see that uh, this, this whole mind has always been there. It will always be there. This Pratnya wisdom never changes. It is just yet there for us to discover. So obviously this understanding of this voidness, of this universe, has different levels in itself. Not to say that the Pratnya is wisdom. Uh, not to say that the Pratnya has different levels. Yeah, we always hear people say, oh, I don't have much wisdom. Okay, I don't have much wisdom. You have more wisdom than I. We cannot say that. Okay, because all of us have the exact same Pratnya wisdom. The only difference is some of us have uh, delusions which cloud this Pratnya wisdom. Some people have less delusion to cloud it. Okay, so in hindsight, we should be saying that we have different levels of understanding of such Pratnya wisdom. Yeah? So we can always see Pratnya wisdom as the understanding that all phenomena lacks an inherent self, as we've mentioned previously many times. And because of this emptiness, everything is transient, okay, everything changes. For example, if today I'm not a good student, I'm not studious, and I cannot do well at school, if I was fixed, if my mind was fixed and already predetermined, then that means there's no point in trying. There's no point in trying to transcend oneself because there is no hope. Yeah? But because everything is transient, it brings us a lot of hope in this, and knowing that we can change our future according to uh, just giving rise to a mind of aspiration yeah? and working at it. So transience is actually a very good thing. And the type of mindset which such an understanding leads to is a mind that does not abide in anything. Okay? So from here we know that, first of all, to have Pratnya wisdom is to see clearly. And after seeing clearly, naturally, we do not abide our minds in anything. So very soon, this whole understanding becomes a type of mindset it becomes a way of life, a way to see the world, okay? So in lay terms, a worldview, okay? A worldview of life. And to have this worldview, it needs to be constant. It needs to happen at every moment of our wondrous existence. It is to say that in every moment of our lives, it is a kind of mindfulness. A kind of mindfulness, but at the same time, 
a type of subtlety where you do not impose such a mindset on every instance of life, but a very relaxed and natural way of seeing uh, what life is all about. Yeah. Okay. So definitely, the the three, the four different views of four ways to see uh, prajna is first of all right view. Okay. So this means that we see uh, the goodness, the wholesomeness of life, the unwholesome of life, and because we see the effects which happen because of our actions, we become careful with our actions. Yeah. So naturally. A wise person will know what is good from bad, what is beneficial or not, and act upon it. Okay, so these people, at least, uh, would be inclined to be reborn as human beings and celestial beings, uh, from the Buddhist, Buddhist cosmology point of view. And those who see that everything is due to dependent origination, for example, we see that this cup has arisen because of the constitutions of metal. Uh, plastic, as well as a lot of technology involved, uh, only then has this cup become what it is. Okay, to see that everything is dependently arisen, and to see that everything ceases because of the lack of cause and conditions, then this is the understanding that the whole world is like that, and also our thinking and mind as well. Even our thoughts, even our own bodies, are bound by such a law of dependent origination. Okay. And emptiness is to see a little bit beyond that. It is to see that because everything is empty, the underlying principle behind it is emptiness. And what is the difference between someone who understands dependent origination and someone who fully understands emptiness? What do you think the difference is? If I can only see things for what they are, and arrive at a conclusion that ha things happen because of thus, and things. Sees because of thus, it means that our understanding is yet somewhat limited, okay? Because we do not have the flexibility of mind to apply uh, such a mind to other things which we have not yet experienced, okay? So people like this, they tend to be awakened as stravakas and prajaka buddhas. People who understand emptiness see that because everything arises and ceases without uh, permanency. Then we can say that the inherent nature is empty, and because of emptiness, we are given a lot of flexibility and hope to do what we want in life. We can create the whole universe uh, per se because of our understanding of emptiness. So it is one step higher, and these people tend to be bodhisattvas or those who have fully come to understand emptiness. And the Buddha is yet again different. Because the Buddha has not only fully understood all emptiness, he appreciates all dependent origination, and he has uh, upheld such understanding to the point where he has completed his mission in liberating all sentient beings. Okay, and having done so, he has fulfilled all merit and all virtue. Okay, so like this,、uh, the Buddha becomes what he is. And to understand、uh, the different levels of understanding of prajna in general,、uh, many Buddhists use the example or analogy of the rabbit, horse, and elephant crossing the river. How much we understand of prajna is how much we have understood it and experienced it for ourselves. How much we have gained insight personally into such a particular truth. Okay. And because the idea of emptiness is very profound, I'd like to spend some time in trying to get our heads around this concept. Yeah. So Venerable Master has been very skillful in using seven different methods、uh, to see the emptiness of all things. Yeah. Starting with the top one, continuous succession. We can see that with、uh, with anything in life, whether it's our mind, whether it's our body, everything is replaced. Just like this hall here, today we are here. Tomorrow it's a different group of people. Okay, within our family homes, sometimes we are inside the home, sometimes we are not. We are replaced all the time. Even with the cells in our body, yeah, we have this physical body of probably body mass 70 kilos, for example. Most likely, as long as you do not put on more weight, you maintain these 70 kilos. But all the cells in the body change constantly. 
There's not one cell which can last for more than a few seconds or a few minutes. They change all the time. So from here we can see the continuous succession of all things. So what is real? Nothing is real. Because everything is replaced and replaced and replaced. And we can also see emptiness through cycles. Okay? Cycles in thoughts, cycles in phenomena, and cycles uh, to do with all sorts of things in life. Okay? Just look at trees. First of all, you have the seed which gives rise, rise to a tree. The tree gives fruit. Okay? The fruit uh, probably drops and rots, and then the seeds turn into new plants. So we can see that this cycle continues on and on and on. Okay? Just like ideology, right? Buddhism, Islam, and even things like ISIS. Okay? First of all, you have this idea. And this idea is expounded over and over again until people see the value in it. And when they see the value in it, then it becomes widespread. And then people uh, pass it on and on and on. So this cycle just keeps going on and on. Okay? Compounding of elements. Okay? We can see this through uh, the body. Yeah. If we do not have a heart, can we, con can we be considered a human being? Probably a dead human being, probably a corpse, but not so much a human being. If we're missing a head, are we still a human being? No. Okay, so we can see that everything is what it is defined to be because of different elements coming together. And if these elements cease to exist, then the form it comes to be or appears to be will change. Okay, so from here we can also see um, emptiness. Next one is relative existence. Okay, what floor are we on right now? Floor one. There's actually the basement, right? So we're, the, we're floor one because there's floor two, there's floor three. Okay, so everything is relative. One person, the very same person, okay, can be considered a husband because he has married a wife. Okay, he can be called a son when he gives, rise, uh, gives birth to a son or the wife. The wife gives birth to a son. He can be called a brother if he has a brother. So the very same person is defined differently according to his relationship to the world. So what exactly is he? The brother, the son, the father, or the grandpa? Who knows? Okay, so from here we can see that even the concept of who a person is changes according to relativity. Okay? We also know that there is no absolute standard. Okay? For example, uh, today we, we say that Audi is the, a very good and prestigious um, automobile brand. Okay? People say Audi, maybe, but probably in the future, when one day they invent something 10 times as expensive as Audi, then Audi will just be like an ordinary person's car, okay? the Joe Blow's car. Okay? So from here we can see that standards are not fixed. So how, how can we define clearly and specifically the standards for everything in life? It's very difficult. Likewise, with temporary names, today I have this tablecloth in front of me. Most likely it is cotton. Okay? And I'm sure most of you are wearing clothes right now. Most of you. Okay? I hope that you all are here. Okay? So if you look at the clothes you're wearing, most likely the material is very similar to this. But because the, what this appears is as tablecloth, we call it tablecloth. What appears as something you wear on your bodies is a shirt. It's your pants. Okay? What you wear on your shoes, on your feet, is shoes. So we can see that uh, things placed in different places for different purposes has different names. So, so from here we can actually also see that everything is empty. The very last one, different perspectives. For a Malaysian or for a Singaporean, durian is the king of fruit. It is probably the most prized fruit uh, within the whole of uh, Malaysia and Singapore. Okay? But elsewhere, it is a revolting fruit. Okay? So we can see that everyone has a different way of saying the same thing. So who is right? Are Singaporeans and Malaysians right? Or are Australians, Taiwanese, and non-Malaysians? 
okay, who is right? There is no defined uh, answer to this. So from here we can see everything is empty. And bringing this back uh, one step closer to our own lives, it's exactly the same as well. Yeah, we all have different views on lives, different from our neighbors, different from our friends. Okay, but sometimes we hold on to these thoughts too thoroughly. Okay, we hold on to these thoughts thinking that this is the right thought. And when people try to give you another opinion, then of course you give rise to a mind of subtle anger. Yeah, thinking that that person does not agree with me. Likewise, if someone threatens you, you also feel that I have been threatened. Okay, but what is the definition of threatened? This is all in the mind. Okay? So from here we can see that many things in life is empty. The next point I'd like to cover is a very important point because it has a lot to do with the actual practice of the sutra. And that is merit and virtue. In Chinese, it's gongda. Uh, okay, in gongda. So who, who thinks merit and virtue are the same thing? Who thinks merit and virtue uh, are the same thing? Okay, they're not. Why not? Because, just say today, we come to the temple and we make a donation of 100 sing dollars. This is a very simple conventional action of making a donation, right? Okay, but the outcome can be very different. The outcome, the outcome can be very different according uh, to the mindset. Okay, so the very same action of giving $100 can mean very different things. First of all, if today I think I, as a person, am, am giving $100 uh, sing dollars to the monastery, hoping that they can benefit from it and then walk away, we have given, yes, but we have given with notion. We have given with the idea that we have lost something. Okay, this probably doesn't hurt as much. Just say we have a very prized possession. Just say we had a very prized house. And, and then of course, because you have a very prized house, maybe your neighbor would like your house. So if your neighbor liked your house and you were generous enough to give your neighbor your house, you would be thinking, I am giving my beloved house to my neighbor. Okay? And because you have thought that this is your house, it hurts a lot to give. And in future, this act of generosity will bring a lot of regret. Yeah? So yes, you have done a good thing. Yes, you have accumulated a good merits. But unfortunately, we have not done good for our own spiritual practice. We have not done good in the sense of bringing happiness to life. Looking back at the $100 Singaporean dollar bill, okay? Just say you rewind history and give the, the, the donation of $100 to the monastery, but this time with a mind without thinking too much and just give with a pure mind and walk away most likely you feel good about it afterwards. Most likely you feel that, okay, I feel like a much better person. Okay? And recently there has been a lot of research on this uh, by a university in Switzerland, Zurich University. Okay? They, had did, they had done this, uh, research on uh, the difference between giving with a calculative mind and giving with a mind free of conditions. Yeah. So giving without condition means just like the way a mother or, or father unconditionally gives to the child. Okay? The father won't say, I give to my child because I, went, I want him to feel that daddy is loving him. Okay? Parents don't do that. Parents just give for the sake of giving. And not even for giving, just giving for, for, for nothing. Right? Most parents. And this is unconditional giving and love. Okay? So such a type of giving will bring, uh, bring one a lot of happiness, bring one a lot of uh, happiness which is free of anxiety. But in hindsight, those who actually give with a type of uh, dualism, with a type of attachment to the gift, the giver or the receiver, uh, these people tend to have less benefit from the act of giving. Okay? So we can see it's a very practical issue. And I'm sure all of us are smart people, yeah? We give the same thing, we do the same things. We might as well use the mind in a way where we can bring happiness onto oneself. 
okay, to let go of attachments and to actually give properly, to actually help people properly, uh, to have a different uh, effect on ourselves. So, Venerable Master Sing Yun, uh, because uh, chapter 17 until 32 is very complex, uh, there's no point going into the fine details in such a short time. So today I'd like to cover uh, some ideas and concepts which hopefully will inspire us to see the benefits of living without abiding and living uh, by giving all our best. Okay? So the first one is uh, giving without notions. The second one is liberating beings with no notion of self or other. Thirdly, to uh, live without abiding and finally to cultivate without attainment. Okay? Uh, in, in having said that, in every instance of us applying the mind, it is, it is important to remind ourselves not to be too attached also to the notion of not being uh, attached to things. Otherwise, we can very easily fall into the other side of the equation, which is nihilism. Okay, nihilism. So, with the first one, let's read the text together. O Shibuti, if an aspirant to awakening were to fill as many world systems as grains of sands of the Ganges River with the seven treasures and give them as gifts, and if another person were to know that all things are without self, and attain acceptance of that, the merit attained by the aspirant to awakening would exceed that of the former aspirant to awakening. O Shibuti, it is because aspirants to awakening do not acquire merit. Okay, so this is interesting. We say that when people give, the merit is not as good as someone who can see past this action. Why is this so? Think about it. Today, for me to be able to give a gift to you, first of all, you will need to be able to have a mind of receiving this gift. So if you do not receive this gift, how can they be a giver? Secondly, there would have to be a, a gift to give in the first place. And how did this gift come to be? It would, it would have come to be from probably working hard to make money and then buying it. So from here we see that the whole action of giving requires many causes and conditions, but any type of attachment to any part of the process of giving will really pull us back and cause us to maintain a mind of petty-mindedness. Okay, so from here we can see that when we give, it needs to be free of notion. Uh, Bodhidharma, one day, okay, when he was having a dialogue with uh, Liang Wudi, Emperor Liang of the Liang, Liang Dynasty, uh, this uh, disciple of the Buddha was very pious. He actually did many things for Buddhism during his reign. Okay? And one day he asked the Buddha, 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 I have uh, established many stupas, I have built many schools, and I have allowed Buddhism to spread far and wide. How much merit have I gained? And what did Bodhidharma say to uh, this emperor? You have gained no merit. What happens if you were the emperor and Bodhidharma said this to you? Do you think you'll be angry? Most likely. And indeed, this emperor was not a happy chap, was not happy at all. But the reason why the Buddha, why Bodhidharma did not uh, say that he had merit is because he did not want to feed his ignorance uh, that he actually had attained merit. Okay? So let's read the next part together. Shibuti addressed the awakened one, saying, O world honored one, how do aspirants to awakening not acquire merit? O Shibuti, the merit made by aspirants to awakening should not be grasped at. Therefore, it is taught that they do not acquire merit. Here, we are negating, we are negating the idea that things should, be, should not be grasped at. Okay, so here it is very clear uh, that the Buddha is trying to say this. And it is done through the idea of breaking through attachment of just even merit in the first place. Whereas before it's about uh, giving and attaining merit, here it's just purely about acquiring merit. Okay? One day uh, there was a Chan master who was very good at expounding the Dharma okay, so to the point where he had many followings. 
And because he had many people listening to the Dharma, very soon the devotees realized that the place of uh, the Dharma talk, his uh, Vahaya, his uh, Vahara, was getting smaller, okay? Not because of its size, but because there were too many people. So the one devotee actually gave rise to the thought of donating 100, um, you could say, tails of gold, hoping that this uh, master will be able to build a big temple, okay? So after the Dharma talk, uh, this devotee handed the, the master 100 tails of gold. And when he handed the tails of gold to the master, the master did not say anything. He just nodded his head and walked away. Okay? And this benefactor thought to himself, hey, I have given this master 100 tails of gold. It is enough to build Foguan San Singapore, such a big temple. And he has said nothing in return. He has not shown any type of gratitude. So because he was not happy with this, he actually turned his back, went back to the monastery, and demanded that the Chan master come out to greet him again. And he said, Master, you do realize that I gave you 100 tails of gold. You realize that that is enough money to construct a big, big temple. And you don't say anything after I gave you this gift? Okay, so obviously uh, this Chan master, in all his wisdom, also knew that he could not uh, entertain this person's misunderstanding of the truth. So this person uh, received the same answer. Devotee, you have mentioned that you have given me 100 tails of gold. Devotee, I know that this money is able to buy a big monastery. Okay, that's it. So obviously this devotee was not happy at all. But the moral of the story is uh, many, many times we try not to entertain someone's generosity uh, by wanting to make them happy. Because in doing so, it's not good for the person who is giving in the first place. Yeah? Okay, let's look at the next line together. Shibuti, what do you think? If someone were to fill the 3,000 world system with the seven treasures, and use them for giving. With this as a cause and condition, he would, attain, would he attain immense merit? So it is, rolled on at one. With this as a cause and a condition, he will attain immense merit. Shibuti, if there really were such a thing as merit, the Tathagata would not speak about attaining immense merit. It is only because there is no such thing as merit that the Tathagata says that immense merit cannot be attained. So this particular verse is also uh, speaking from the perspective that someone would have already fully understood uh, that one should give without notions. And having said so, then the Tathagata reminds them that yes, if you do uh, generosity in such a way, then of course uh, there is immense merit to be gained. So one day Ananda and the Buddha were walking around and uh, they were going on their arms procession, you know, uh, begging for food. And at a particular point in the procession, they met uh, a group of children playing with sand castles. Okay, they were trying to build a sand castle uh, with a storeroom of rice and play, uh, pretend, you know, play, okay, I'm, I'm your father, I'm your son, we're in a family, okay, I have a store, storeroom of rice and this is life. Okay? And upon greeting the Buddha, uh, one child scooped up this make, make uh, pretend rice, which was sand, and offered it to the Buddha with utmost sincerity. And because he had done so, uh, the Buddha had received such offering with, uh, with a mind of joy. And then, of course, after returning to the Vihara to eat, what would you say? What, what happens if you were Ananda and the Buddha received sand as lunch? What would you say to the Buddha? Hey, Buddha, you realize that what you received was sand. Why did you receive it in the first place? So the Buddha here uh, replied, Ananda, don't think that this child is giving me just an ordinary gift. Okay. This child is giving a gift with utmost sincerity, and that is why we should receive this gift with happiness. The Buddha never received gift looking at the value of the gift. Okay, the Buddha receives the gift looking at the sincerity. 
And just like that, uh, the Buddha went on to explain, to foretell that uh, these young children, the child who actually gave uh, the rice offering of sand, uh, was to become King Ashoka, okay, the one who was to uh, turn the wheel of the Dharma and cause Buddhism to prosper. And all the uh, kids playing around him will be his ministers. So from this very simple act of giving something without much value, because it was done with utmost sincerity, then of course uh, the outcome is very different. So this goes to show that many times it, it is not the value of the gift, but the way we give in the first place. Okay, let's look at the next part. Liberating beings without notion of self. World honored one, when good men and good women initiate the mind to Anitara Samyak Sambuddhi, what should they abide in? And how should they subdue their minds? Okay. This particular question was asked one month ago by Venerable Yodeng, Fascicle 2. Okay. But what is the difference between Fascicle 2 and Fascicle 17? The biggest difference is not in this particular question. It is later on. Uh, the ensuing, uh, you could say, bit of exposition about why we should do things this way. Okay, we will get into this very shortly. But in terms of initiating the Anitara mind, okay, the mind of excelled, unexcelled wisdom and enlightenment, uh, there are several things I'd like to share. Okay? I think as people who live at home, it's very difficult to give rise to a mind of wanting to seek some type of transcendental wisdom, uh, which uh, sometimes see, seems very different from our ordinary life. Okay, but as we mentioned at the beginning of this session, uh, the Dharma and our lives cannot be separated. Okay? This wisdom is a, a way of thinking, a worldview we slowly develop and apply it to every instance within our lives. Okay? So in having said this, it is important to generate the right kind of mindset to be able to equip ourselves with the right mental attitude to life. Okay? So Venerable Master, before he was 20, yeah, just like any young child, he would pray to the Buddha, wishing that, Buddha, Buddha, I wish that I can be a good student. I wish that I can be someone with the capacity to learn as much as I can, because I want to succeed in the future. Okay? But by the time he was 30, he realized that I cannot just keep uh, begging to the Buddha for myself. I cannot just keep asking the Buddha for blessings on my own behalf. So I need to think of not only myself, but my teachers, my friends, my colleagues, as well as all the people around me, people who have affinity with me. So from the age of 20 to 30, he did this. But when he reached the age of 40, he realized that even so, he was only concerned about people around him. And also, this is selfish, so he changed his aspiration. He vowed that from this day on, I will vow that all sentient beings be happy and free. All, all societies and all worlds be free of uh, calamity and be having freedom and happiness. So we can see that bit by bit, a Venerable Master's vow has changed. And then finally, when he reached the age of 50, even the fact that he was praying to the Buddha in the first place, he saw this as a type of selfishness, thinking that how can I always rely on the Buddha? How can I trouble the Buddha so much to do all this? From this day on, I will, just like the Buddha, okay, take on the karmic hindrances and obstructions of all sentient beings. I will shoulder all the mental, uh, you could say, imperfections of all sentient beings, emotional calamities, so that people can be happy I will emulate uh, the, the, the Buddha spirit of sharing the Dhamma with others. I shall emulate the Buddha spirit of uh, using expediency to bring people to the Dharma. So we can see that the Buddha had, um, the Master had went through a process and a very long process of initiating uh, this mind of Anitara Samyak Sambuddhi. So it's not something that happens overnight. It's, it's something which happens over a prolonged period of time, okay? So let's read the next part together. The Buddha said to Shibuti, when good men and good women initiate the mind to Anitara Samyak Sambuddhi, 
they should give rise to a mind like this. I should liberate all sentient beings, and as I liberate them, I should know that there is no sentient beings to liberate. And why is this? If a bodhisattva has a notion of self, notion of others, notion of sentient beings, and notion of longevity, then he is not a bodhisattva. And why is this? Shibuti. In truth, there is no phenomenon of initiating the mind to Anitara Samyak Sambuddhi. Okay. First of all, let us first, uh, let us first ignore the first part in red. Okay. This we'll get into in a bit more detail. Importantly, the, the very last line, there is no phenomena in initiating Anitara Samyak Sambuddhi. So the very understanding of making a vow to do something, even that, we need to remember that this is just one instance in time. But if we're attached to it, it's kind of like saying this, I want to do well in school so I can go to law school in future. Okay, or I can do a master's in law. Okay, the very fact that we've made this vow is not enough. If we're too attached to the words of the vow, it's very hard for us to progress by actually actualizing our vow in the first place. Okay, so many times we vow, many times we promise, but it's very hard for us to do. Okay, who knows the four standards, the, the four verses, uh, the four foreground verses? Who can memorize this by heart? Who can memorize the four foreground standards by, by heart? Okay, let's read it together. Can we do it? Can we actualize it? Maybe not. So the Buddha is reminding us, we don't just do this before meals, we need to do it in our lives. We don't do it after evening service or during Dharma services, but we need to actualize it in everyday life. So from here we see that uh, the Buddha is trying to take us one step further to see beyond the words and to see uh, what actually is. Okay? The next part of the equation, we did mention that we read upon not being attached to self and others. Okay? The definition of self is a, a not autonomy, permanency, universal, universality and freedom. Yeah. But all of these are not present within oneself, as we all know. Okay? So from this we understand that we need to have a mindset which does not discriminate between self. Because when we have an understanding of self, then we have a, an understanding of other. And that is where a lot of conflict arises. Okay? We then have vested interest. We then have uh, group vested interest. And that is how people and groups come to have a lot of disagreements with one another. Okay? And the even understanding that I am who am I. Okay? Sometimes we place too much importance on this I. So much so that this I becomes more important than everyone around us, our family, our friends, and even our teachers. Okay? And when come a point this becomes out of hand, then we are just bringing a lot of problems to ourselves. Okay? Because every time someone says something nice to you, it does not register anymore. anymore. It may seem just like an attack on oneself. Okay? So such a, an attachment to non-self is very troublesome. Has anyone heard of Yishu uh, Chan Si, a very famous Chan master from a long time ago? Okay? I'd like to share a story of him. Uh, one day, a disciple who had a very prosperous business came to him. Master, Master, I want to commit suicide because my business has failed and I am now bankrupt. I cannot make ends meet. Okay? Chan Master replied, Disciple, are you sure there's no way out of your uh, tr problems? Is, is the only way out of your problems uh, suicide? I'm sure there's a way. Master, I have lost everything in life. The only thing I have is one daughter. Don't you worry, don't you worry. The only problem now you have is lack of money. I can sort that out for you. Go and find a handsome son-in-law 
and I, I'm sure that this handsome man will one day support you, so you no longer need to worry about finances. Uh, master, master, I can't do that. My daughter is only eight years old. I can't marry my, my, my daughter off. Devotee, don't you worry. If you're not willing to marry your daughter off who's eight, I will marry your daughter. Let me marry your daughter. Okay? So just do what I say and follow exactly and everything will fall into place. Go and arrange for a marriage between yourself, your daughter and myself and I will do so at your household. So this disciple, he was thinking, you're my beloved master, my revered master. How can you, I call you son-in-law? It does not make sense. Yeah? But because uh, this, this devotee had a lot of faith in the, in the Chan master, he actually followed exactly according to plan. So he arranged for this very, very big banquet, a very, very big uh, wedding at his household. And come the day, this Chan master had requested one ink pad, okay, a pen as well as some ink. And very quickly, he took to his uh, pen and paper and started doing calligraphy. And because he was a renowned calligraphy artist, very soon he produced a lot of pieces of calligraphy which a lot of devotees had interest in. And all along in the history of Buddhism, uh, this was a way of fundraising as well. So naturally, people placed a lot of donations inside a basket next to his, his calligraphy. And very soon, after just several hours, uh, this basket by the side of him had filled to the brink of donations. At this point, the Chan master put down his calligraphy pen and said, Okay, devotee, you said that you are bankrupt. Don't you worry. This whole basket is full of money. I'm sure you can live off this basket of money for the rest of, of, of your life. There is no need to commit suicide. And also, because I have helped you sort your issues, I no longer need to be your son-in-law. So, I can continue to be the Chan master I was previously. Thank you. And the story happily finishes just like this. But, if today the Chan master was attached to the notion of self, it's impossible for him to do this because he would have the understanding that I am the Chan Master. I have a type of status within this uh, Buddhist community. How can I do so? Just like the Pope who kissed the feet of the two leaders or the in intermediary leader of Sudan, okay? How can he do that? It is because he has let go of the attachment to I. So this is very powerful. And if we can do so in life, then there is so much we can do. We can just be like Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva in the field we are doing and serve the people without such stature, without such attachment to wanting people to respect us. And very quickly we, we can feel that life becomes much more happy than what it is. Okay? So let's read the next part together. Shibuti, what do you think? Do not say that the Tathagata has this thought. I should liberate sentient beings. Shibuti, do not have this thought. And why is this? In reality, there are no sentient beings for the Tathagata to liberate. Okay. Secondly, Shibuti, the Tathagata says that ordinary beings are not ordinary beings and that this is what is called ordinary beings. Okay. To liberate without thinking that you have liberated. Okay? It's kind of like today you're upset. I am going to make you not upset. I have my way of thinking of how to make you not upset. I don't care what you think. You're upset, I will make you not upset. Do you think such a person will be a good psychologist? Maybe not. Okay? Because this person has preconceptions. But today, if I let go of these preconceptions and just listen very carefully to what you have to say, then this is a type of liberating uh, without attaching to notion. This is something which uh, I think is very important. Okay? And to see that ordinary people are not ordinary people. In Buddhism, we say that the mind, the Buddha, and all sentient beings are equal. Okay, meaning that we all have this potentiality, this pratnya wisdom within. But there are differences. It's not to say that there are not differences. 
Otherwise, we no longer need the Dharma. Just like the Buddha here, he no longer needs to practice the Dharma because he has completely practiced it to the ultimate level. Okay? But why do we need to practice Buddhism? It is because we have come to this world with different levels of karma. So obviously, we all appear differently and with different backgrounds. In having said this, there's a Buddhist saying, right? In equality, there's inequality. In inequality, there's equality. Equality meaning that all of us have potentiality. Inequality meaning that because of our past actions, we all have different karma. And because of that, some people are born rich, some people are born not so rich, some people are born with uh, great intel intelligence, some people are born with uh, needing more help with their intelligence. Okay? But the, the equality which comes after that is in the fact that we can change. No matter how unintelligent we are, as long as we work hard, then in the future, one day we, we will become intelligent. So this goes to show the type of uh, spirit behind such a teaching. Okay? The next part, living without abiding. Let's read this together. The Buddha said to Shibuti, the Tathagata fully knows and fully sees the minds of all sentient beings in all of these worlds. And how can this be? The Tathagata has said that all minds are not minds, and thus they are called minds. And why is this, Shibuti? The mind of the past cannot be obtained. The mind of the present cannot be obtained. And the mind of the future cannot be obtained. Okay. There are many implications to this, yeah? We know that there is the past, the present, and the future. If today I was always thinking about the past, what kind of person will I be? A nostalgic person. Okay, this person will always think about the past, but in having done so, he or she will neglect the present, and very soon there will be no future. But if someone focuses too much on the present, and is attached to all the sensory offerings of the present, then unfortunately, he will be lost in the present and he will not be ready for the future. So either way, it is not good. Okay? For example, if, uh, if person A, let's, let's call him Peter. If Peter had uh, called me something, something bad, if he called me an idiot, in a, if I kept this at heart, the moment he called me an idiot has passed. Now is present. If I keep thinking about the fact that he has called me an idiot, I will start forming preconceptions. I will start forming a type of preconception to Peter. So in the future when I see him, I will have hatred towards him. And in doing so, I miss out on all of the nice things which happen now and in the future. So we can see that the past, present, and future are connected together. But as long as we don't abide in either the past or the present or the future, then of course we can be happy people. What happens if we attach ourselves to the future too much? Two things. One, you're overly thinking. Two, we're daydreaming. Okay? So we should not uh, attach to past, present, and future. Okay. In Buddhism, we have eight winds. What are the eight winds? What are the eight winds? Praise, blame, what else? Def defamation, honor, gain, loss, suffering, and joy. All these different uh, phenomena, phenomena, phenomena of life, yeah? When we come into contact with all these, I think the type of attitude which is most beneficial in such a circumstance is definitely take a step back, see clearly. When things come, let them come. When they go, let them go. But then we still need to get on with our lives. Okay? So this idea of not attaching to either the past, present, or future is very powerful. Okay, let's read the next slide together. Like shadows, like bubbles, like dreams. All conditioned phenomena are like dreams, illusions, bubbles, and shadows, like dew and lightning. And one should contemplate this in this way. Okay. In life, there are many things which are transient. Okay. 
are very transient, and sometimes we see things more real than they are, just like a bubble. Many times we have young children. Okay, when they blow into the in, into the bubble blower, they try to catch it, thinking that it is more real than they are. Okay, and in life there are many things which we feel are more real than they are. What people say, what people think, what we do, what we attain in life. Many times it's just phenomena, which is a part of life. But sometimes we hold on it too much. Okay, let me ask you guys a question. Who has the habit of saying omitofo, omitofo? Who has the habit of saying omitofo? Just one person. Are you sure? What do you see when you see your dumber brothers and sisters? Okay, amitaba. Fine. Most of you are English speaking. Fine, amitaba. Who says amitaba when they come to the monastery? Yeah, quite a few people. But people say amitaba for different reasons. Some people say Amitabha as a greeting. Amitabha, Jama brother. Okay, brother John, brother brother Peter. Some people say Amitabha when they accidentally drop something. It's like ah, Amitabha, Amitabha. Yeah. Other times, people complain about people. Ah, that brother John. Every time he does that, it annoys me. Oh, Amitabha. Okay. So the very, the very same word omitofo can mean different things with different intentions, but sometimes we don't see this. Sometimes when people have interactions with us, the way they put themselves forward and interact with us, sometimes we we are too caught up with the way people treat us. But many times we don't understand the intention behind it. Okay, sometimes we are scolded by people, but they do so out of loving kindness. Okay. So we, sometimes we need to see beyond that black dot, see uh, through all the different causing conditions. Okay, just like um, in Malaysia, salamat means uh, to be at peace or to be to be safe, whereas in the Philippines it means thank you. Okay, certain hand gestures can be something positive in some cultures and not positive in other cultures. Yeah. So how can we say whether this is good or not? Yeah. So we should not be too bothered. What does this mean? Okay, in Singapore. Okay, in Australia. Yes. Okay, in the United States. But in France, never do this. So never, never do this. It means something I should not say because I'm being recorded right now. Okay. So definitely, uh, many different things in different places uh, mean different things. So it's something to keep in mind as we practice. Okay, uh, we're kind of short of time. Let's read the very last part before we finish for today. Okay, cultivating without attainment. Furthermore, Shibuti, the Dharma is equal and without high or low. This is called Anitara Samyak Sambodhi, because one is without without self, without others, and without sentient beings, and without longevity. He practices all wholesome teachings and attains Anuttara Samyaksambuddhi. Shibuti, what is called all wholesome teachings? The Tathagata says they are not all wholesome teachings, and thus they are called all wholesome teachings. Okay. The whole idea that the Dharma is neither high or low refers to the idea that although the Pratnya wisdom and the entirety of the Dharma. Is actually unconditioned. So whether the Buddha had expounded on the Dharma or not, the Dharma has always been here, even before we came and after we will pass on to our future lives. The, the Dharma never changes. But the Buddha has, during his lifetime, tried to express the Dharma in understandable ways for us to practice, out of great compassion. In having said this, there are many different teachings of the Dharma. And some teachings we consider the superior teachings. Some teachings we consider very basic teachings. But remember the concept of just giving in itself. If we give an expensive gift with the wrong type of understanding, then of course the effect is not so good. To give a very inexpensive gift with a mind of purity, then of course the effect is so much more better. Okay, so likewise with the Dharma. If you can practice the very simple act of doing good things, saying good words, and having good thoughts, 
and doing so with a mind of non-abiding, then very easily we can attain such virtuous merits, such virtue which can allow us to transcend oneself. So the, the problem is not the Dharma, it's the way we apply the Dharma. And this is exactly what the whole Diamond Sutra is all about. Okay, one day the, the Buddha had a disciple who was someone who could not learn properly. Even learning compound words like teacup, by the time you taught him tea, and by the time you continued to cup, he would have forgotten tea. At least none of, none of us here are like that, although I'm kind of inclined to be like that, okay? Most of us are not like this, but imagine if you were someone who could not learn, yeah? You would be very disheartened, and, and consequently, this uh, particular disciple was bullied by many people within the monastery. And because he was bullied frequently, and especially by his own older brother, who was also a monastic, uh, very soon he gave rise to the mind of leaving the monastery. So one day the Buddha found him at the gates of the monastery sobbing, very upset at the fact that he had ho no hope of memorizing the sutras, which was mandatory uh, to be able to use it later on. Nothing was written down during those days. And he was very upset, but the Buddha was very compassionate. Okay? He said, disciple, disciple, don't you worry. Just follow my instructions carefully and one day you will be just like all the other monks, nice and wise. Every time you sweep the floor, recite the word broom. That will be your task from now on for the rest of your life. So that is exactly what he did. Every time he brushed, his, brushed the floor or sweep the floor, he'd recite broom. And after one month of doing this, he had a sudden insight, realization. This broom is something used to sweep the floor. So when I sweep the floor, I am sweeping dirt. And after a while, he did this for a while, okay? And, and then he after that realized that not only is my mind and body just like the ground nice and dirty, I also need to sweep the mind. So very soon, he became an arhat from cleaning the mind of defilements. Let me ask you, who thinks that broom is a Buddhist mantra? Who thinks that broom is just like Ta Pei Zhou, the great compassion Dharani? Who thinks that broom is just like saying Omitofo? No one. The reason why we think so is because people tell us. People can become awakened because of broom. Why can't we? Okay, so this goes to show that sometimes we cannot be attached to the word. We need to really focus on actually putting things into practice. Okay? So just like this elephant here, our understanding of the Dharma is just like understanding the different parts of the, ele of the elephant. No Dharma is better than the other. It's just approaching this elephant from different angles. But most importantly, we come to understand the whole uh, elephant as it is. Okay? So basically, if we, if we can do this, and very quickly, we can see that the Diamond Sutra is very practical. Okay? Let's read this uh, last bit as a conclusion. If anyone should think that I can see, be seen amongst forms, or that I can be sought amongst sounds, then that person is on the wrong path, and he cannot see the Tathagata. In closing, I'd like to encourage everyone, first of all, to at least get to understand the Diamond Sutra better. Secondly, to apply that type of mindset, not to abide your mind in any concept or phenomena and to see the bigger picture, okay? In having done so, we can observe the causes and conditions as they come and very actively with a mind free of attachment and discrimination, uh, make the most of every single situation in life you find yourself in. Be that proactive Buddhist and make a difference in life. And because of that, then people will see that this uh, Diamond Sutra is very powerful. They will want to learn it as well, okay? There is a saying, if you want to see the Buddha, first of all, see dependent origination. When you can fully understand dependent origination, you have seen the true Dharma. And when you, when you see the true Dharma, then you can see the Buddha. So guys, please be brave and say, I am the Buddha, I am the Buddha-to-be, and one day 
definitely through a lot of practice, you will definitely become just like the Buddha here uh, today in front of us. Okay, thank you. And uh, I'd like to close off by uh, having a bit of a discussion. Would anyone like to have a bit of a, a question and answer session? Probably two or three minutes, five minutes at most. Nope. Okay, if not, then I guess uh, we can finish off for today. Thank you. Thank you, Venerable Hui Chen. Let's give a, round, a warm round of applause to him for sharing about the Diamonds to Try. Everybody, please rise, join palms, and together bow to Venerable Hui Chen. Thank you, Venerable.